Chapter 73 I used to think that mother and father might get divorced. That was because they had lots of arguments, and sometimes they hated each other. This was because of the stress of looking after someone who has behavioural problems, like I have. I used to have lots of behavioural problems, but I don't have so many now because I'm more grown up and I can take decisions for myself and do things on my own, like going out of the house and buying things at the shop at the end of the road. These are some of my behavioural problems. A. Not talking to people for a long time. Once, I didn't talk to anyone for five weeks. B. Not eating or drinking anything for a long time. When I was six, Mother used to get me to drink strawberry-flavoured slimming meals out of a measuring jug, and we'd have competitions to see how fast I could drink a quarter of a litre. C. Not liking being touched. D. Screaming when I'm angry or confused. E. Not liking being in really small places with other people. F. Smashing things when I'm angry or confused. G. Groaning. H. Not liking yellow things or brown things and refusing to touch yellow things or brown things. I. Refusing to use my toothbrush if anyone else has touched it. J. Not eating food if different sorts of food are touching each other. K. Not noticing that people are angry with me. L. Not smiling. M. Saying things that other people think are rude. People say that you always have to tell the truth, but they do not mean this, because you're not allowed to tell old people that they're old, and you're not allowed to tell people if they smell funny, or if a grown-up has made a fart. And you're not allowed to say, I don't like you, unless that person has been horrible to you. N. Doing stupid things. Stupid things are things like emptying a jar of peanut butter onto the table in the kitchen and making it level with a knife so that it covers all the table right to the edges, or burning things on the gas stove to see what will happen to them, like my shoes, or silver foil, or sugar. O. Hitting other people. P. Hating France. Q. Driving mother's car. I only did this once by borrowing the keys when she went into town on the bus, and I hadn't driven a car before, and I was eight years old and five months, so I drove it into the wall, and the car isn't there anymore because mother's dead. Ah, getting cross when someone has moved the furniture. It is permitted to move the chairs and the table in the kitchen, because that's different, but it makes me feel dizzy and sick if someone has moved the sofa and the chairs around in the living room or the dining room. Mother used to do this when she did the hoovering, so I made a special plan of where all the furniture's meant to be and did measurements, and I put everything back in its proper place afterwards, and then I felt better. But since Mother died, Father hasn't done any hoovering, so that's okay. And Mrs. Shears did the hoovering once, but I did groaning, and she shouted at Father, and she never did it again. Sometimes, these things would make mother and father really angry, and they'd shout at me, or they'd shout at each other. Sometimes, father would say, Christopher, if you do not behave, I swear I shall knock the living daylights out of you. Or mother would say, Jesus, Christopher, I'm seriously considering putting you in a hole. Or mother would say, you are going to drive me into an early grave. Chapter 79 When I got home, Father was sitting at the table in the kitchen, and he had made my supper. He was wearing a lumberjack shirt. The supper was baked beans and broccoli and two slices of ham, and they were laid out on the plate so that they weren't touching. He said, Where have you been? And I said, I've been out. This is called a white lie. A white lie is not a lie at all. It's where you tell the truth, but you don't tell all of the truth. This means that everything you say is a white lie, 
Because when someone says, for example, what do you want to do today? You say, I want to do painting with Mrs. Peters. But you don't say, I want to have my lunch, and I want to go to the toilet, and I want to go home after school, and I want to play with Toby, and I want to have my supper, and I want to play on my computer, and I want to go to bed. And I said a white lie because I knew that father didn't want me to be a detective. Father said, I've just had a phone call from Mrs. Shears. I started eating my baked beans and broccoli and two slices of ham. Then father asked, what the hell were you doing poking around her garden? I said, I was doing detective work trying to find out who killed Wellington. Father replied, how many times do I have to tell you, Christopher? The baked beans and the broccoli and the ham were cold, but I didn't mind this. I eat very slowly, so my food is nearly always cold. Father said, I told you to keep your nose out of other people's business. I said, I think Mr. Shears probably killed Wellington. Father didn't say anything. I said, he's my prime suspect. Because I think someone might have killed Wellington to make Mrs. Shears sad. And a murder is usually committed by someone known. Father banged the table with his fist really hard so that the plates and his knife and fork jumped around and my ham jumped sideways so that it touched the broccoli, so I couldn't eat the ham or the broccoli anymore. Then he shouted, I will not have that man's name mentioned in my house. I asked, why not? And he said, that man is evil. And I said, does that mean he might have killed Wellington? Father put his head in his hands and said, Jesus wept. I could see that father was angry with me, so I said, I know you told me not to get involved in other people's business, but Mrs. Shears is a friend of ours. And father said, well, she's not a friend anymore. And I asked, why not? And father said, okay, Christopher, I am gonna say this for the last and final time. I will not tell you again. Look at me when I'm talking to you for God's sake, look at me. You are not to go asking Mrs. Shears about who killed that bloody dog. You are not to go asking anyone about who killed that bloody dog. You are not to go trespassing in other people's gardens. You are to stop this ridiculous bloody detective game right now. I didn't say anything. Father said, I'm going to make you promise, Christopher. And you know what it means when I'll make you promise. I did know what it meant when you say you promise something. You have to say that you will never do something again, and then you must never do it, because that would make the promise a lie. I said, I know. Father said, promise me you will stop doing these things. Promise me that you will give up this ridiculous game right now. Okay? I said, I promise. Chapter 83 I think I would make a very good astronaut. To be a good astronaut, you have to be intelligent, and I'm intelligent. You also have to understand how machines work, and I'm good at understanding how machines work. You also have to be someone who would like being on their own in a tiny spacecraft thousands and thousands of miles away from the surface of the Earth and not panic or get claustrophobia or homesick or insane. And I really like little spaces, so long as there's no one else in them with me. Sometimes, when I want to be on my own, I get into the airing cupboard in the bathroom and slide in beside the boiler and pull the door closed behind me and sit there and think for hours, and it makes me feel very calm. So I would have to be an astronaut on my own, or have my own part of the spacecraft which no one else could come into. And also, there are no yellow things or brown things in a spacecraft, so that would be okay too. And I would have to talk to other people from Mission Control, but we'd do that through a radio link-up and a TV monitor, so they wouldn't be like real people who are strangers, but it would be like playing a computer game. 
and I wouldn't be homesick at all because I'd be surrounded by lots of the things I like, which are machines and computers and outer space. And I'd be able to look out of a little window in the spacecraft and know that there was no one else near me for thousands and thousands of miles, which is what I sometimes pretend at night in the summer when I go and lie on the lawn and look up at the sky and I put my hands round the sides of my face so that I can't see the fence and the chimney and the washing line and I can pretend I'm in space. And all I could see would be stars. And stars are the places where the molecules that life is made of were constructed billions of years ago. For example, all the iron in your blood which stops you being anemic was made in a star. And I would like it if I could take Toby with me into space, and that might be allowed, because they sometimes do take animals into space for experiments. So if I could think of a good experiment you could do with a rat that didn't hurt the rat, I could make them let me take Toby. But if they didn't let me, I'd still go, because it would be a dream come true. Chapter 89 the next day at school, I told Siobhan that father had told me I couldn't do any more detecting, which meant that the book was finished. I showed her the pages I had written so far, with the diagram of the universe and the map of the street and the prime numbers, and she said that it didn't matter. She said the book was really good as it was, and that I should be very proud of having written a book at all, even if it was quite short, and there were some very good books which were very short like Heart of Darkness, which was by Conrad. But I said that it wasn't a proper book, because it didn't have a proper ending, because I never found out who killed Wellington, so the murderer was still at large. And she said that was like life, and not all murders were solved, and not all murderers were caught, like Jack the Ripper. I said I didn't like the idea that the murderer was still at large, I said I didn't like to think that the person who killed Wellington could be living somewhere nearby, and I might meet him when I went out for a walk at night, and this was possible, because a murder was usually committed by a person who was known to the victim. Then I said, Father said I was never to mention Mr. Shear's name in our house again, and that he was an evil man, and maybe that meant he was the person who killed Wellington. And she said, Perhaps your father just doesn't like Mr. Shears very much. And I asked, why? And she said, I don't know, Christopher. I don't know because I don't know anything about Mr. Shears. I said, Mr. Shears used to be married to Mrs. Shears, and he left her, like in a divorce. But I don't know if they were actually divorced. And Siobhan said, well, Mrs. Shears is a friend of yours, isn't she? A friend of you and your father. So perhaps your father doesn't like Mr. Shears because he left Mrs. Shears, because he did something bad to someone who's a friend. And I said, but father says Mrs. Shears isn't a friend of ours anymore. And Siobhan said, I'm sorry, Christopher. I wish I could answer all these questions, but I simply don't know. Then the bell went for the end of school. The next day, I saw four yellow cars in a row on the way to school, which made it a black day. So I didn't eat anything at lunch, and I sat in the corner of the room all day and read my A-level maths course book. And the next day, too, I saw four yellow cars in a row on the way to school, which made it another black day, too. So I didn't speak to anyone, and for the whole afternoon, I sat in the corner of the library, groaning, with my head pressed into the join between the two walls, and this made me feel calm and safe. But on the third day, I kept my eyes closed all the way to school until we got off the bus, because after I've had two black days in a row, I'm allowed to do that. Chapter 97 But it wasn't the end of the book, because five days later, I saw five red cars in a row, which made it a super good day, and I knew that something special was going to happen. Nothing special happened at school, so I knew that something special was going to happen after school. 
And when I got home, I went down to the shop at the end of our road to buy some licorice laces and a milky bar with my pocket money. And when I had bought my licorice laces and a milky bar, I turned round and saw Mrs. Alexander, the old lady from number 39, who was in the shop as well. She wasn't wearing jeans now. She was wearing a dress like a normal old lady. And she smelt of cooking. She said, What happened to you the other day? I asked, Which day? And she said, I came out again and you'd gone. I had to eat all the biscuits myself. I said, I went away. And she said, I gathered that. I said, I thought you might ring the police. And she said, why on earth would I do that? And I said, because I was poking my nose into other people's business. And father said I shouldn't investigate who killed Wellington. And a policeman gave me a caution. And if I get into trouble again, it will be a lot worse because of the caution. Then the Indian lady behind the counter said to Mrs. Alexander, Can I help you? And Mrs. Alexander said she'd like a pint of milk and a packet of Jaffa cakes. And I went out of the shop. When I was outside the shop, I saw that Mrs. Alexander's dachshund was sitting on the pavement. It was wearing a little coat made out of tartan material, which is Scottish and Czech. She had tied its lead to the drain pipe next to the door. I like dogs, so I bent down and I said hello to her dog and it licked my hand. Its tongue was rough and wet and it liked the smell on my trousers and started sniffing them. Then Mrs. Alexander came outside and said, his name is Ival. I didn't say anything. And Mrs. Alexander said, You're very shy, aren't you, Christopher? And I said, I'm not allowed to talk to you. And she said, Don't worry, I'm not going to tell the police, and I'm not going to tell your father, because there's nothing wrong with having a chat. Having a chat is just being friendly, isn't it? I said, I can't do chatting. Then she said, do you like computers? And I said, yes, I like computers. I have a computer at home in my bedroom. And she said, I know. I can see you sitting at your computer in your bedroom sometimes when I look across the street. Then she untied Ivor's lead from the drain pipe. I wasn't going to say anything because I didn't want to get into trouble. Then I thought that this was a super good day and something special hadn't happened yet, so it was possible that talking to Mrs. Alexander was the special thing that was going to happen. And I thought that she might tell me something about Wellington or about Mr. Shears without me asking her, so that wouldn't be breaking my promise. So I said, and I like maths and looking after Toby, and also I like outer space and I like being on my own. And she said, I bet you're very good at maths, aren't you? And I said, I am. I'm going to do my A-level maths next month, and I'm going to get an A grade. And Mrs. Alexander said, really? A-level maths? I replied, yes, I don't tell lies. And she said, I apologize. I didn't mean to suggest that you were lying. I just wondered if I'd heard you correctly. I'm a little deaf sometimes. And I said, I remember you told me. And then I said, I'm the first person to do an A-level from my school because it's a special school. And she said, well, I'm very impressed and I hope you do get an A. And I said, I oh, will. And she said, and the other thing I know about you is that your favorite color is not yellow. And I said, no, and it's not brown either. My favourite colour is red and metal colour. Then Ivor did a poo and Mrs Alexander picked it up with her hand inside a little plastic bag and then she turned the plastic bag inside out and tied a knot in the top so that the poo was all sealed up and she didn't touch the poo with her hands. And then I did some reasoning. I reasoned that Father had only made me do a promise about five things, which were... One, not to mention Mr. Shears name in our house. Two, not to go asking Mrs. Shears about who killed that bloody dog. Three, not to go asking anyone about who killed that bloody dog. Four, 
not to go trespassing into other people's gardens. 5. To stop this ridiculous bloody detective game. And asking about Mr. Shears wasn't any of these things. And if you're a good detective, you have to take risks. And this was a super good day, which meant it was a good day for taking risks. So I said, do you know Mr. Shears? Which was like chatting. And Mrs. Alexander said, not really, no. I mean, I knew him well enough to say hello and talk to a little in the street, but I didn't know much about him. I think he worked in a bank, the National Westminster in town. And I said, Father says that he's an evil man. Do you know why he said that? Is Mr. Shears an evil man? And Mrs. Alexander said, Why are you asking me about Mr. Shears, Christopher? I didn't say anything, because I didn't want to be investigating Wellington's murder, and that was the reason I was asking about Mr. Shears. But Mrs. Alexander said, Is this about Wellington? And I nodded, because that didn't count as being a detective. Mrs. Alexander didn't say anything. She walked to the little red box on a pole next to the gate to the park, and she put Ivor's poo into the box, which was a brown thing inside a red thing, which made my head feel funny, so I didn't look. Then she walked back to me. She sucked in a big breath and said, Perhaps it would be best not to talk about these things, Christopher. And I asked, why not? And she said, because... Then she stopped and decided to start saying a different sentence. Because maybe your father's right and you shouldn't go around asking questions about this. And I asked, why? And she said, because obviously he's going to find it quite upsetting. And I said, why is he going to find it upsetting? Then she sucked in another big breath and said, because, because I think you know why your father doesn't like Mr. Shears very much. Then I asked, did Mr. Shears kill mother? And Mrs. Alexander said, kill her? And I said, yes, did he kill mother? And Mrs. Alexander said, no, no, of course he didn't kill your mother. And I said, but did he give her stress so that she died of a heart attack? And Mrs. Alexander said, I honestly don't know what you're talking about, Christopher. And I said, well, did he hurt her so that she had to go into hospital? And Mrs. Alexander said, did she have to go into hospital? And I said, yes, and it wasn't very serious at first, but she had a heart attack when she was in hospital. And Mrs. Alexander said, oh my goodness. I said, and she died. And Mrs. Alexander said, oh my goodness, again. And then she said, oh, Christopher, I'm so, so sorry. I never realised. Then I asked her, Why did you say, I think you know why your father doesn't like Mr. Shears very much? Mrs. Alexander put her hand over her mouth and said, Oh, dear, dear, dear. But she didn't answer my question. So I asked her the same question again, because in a murder mystery novel, when someone doesn't want to answer a question, it's because they're trying to keep a secret or trying to stop someone getting into trouble, which means that the answers to those questions are the most important answers of all, and that's why the detective has to put that person under pressure. But Mrs. Alexander still didn't answer. Instead, she asked me a question. She said, so you don't know. And I said, don't know what? She replied, Christopher, look, I probably shouldn't be telling you this. Then she said, perhaps we should take a little walk in the park together. This is not the place to be talking about this kind of thing. I was nervous. I didn't know Mrs. Alexander. I knew that she was an old lady and that she liked dogs. But she was a stranger. 
and I never go into the park on my own because it's dangerous and people inject drugs behind the public toilets in the corner. I wanted to go home and go up to my room and feed Toby and practice some maths. But I was excited too because I thought she might tell me a secret and the secret might be about who killed Wellington or about Mr. Shears. And if she did that, I might have more evidence against him or be able to exclude him from my investigations. So because it was a super good day, I decided to walk into the park with Mrs. Alexander, even though it scared me. When we were inside the park, Mrs. Alexander stopped walking and said, I'm going to say something to you, and you must promise not to tell your father that I told you this. I asked, why? And she said, I shouldn't have said what I said. And if I don't explain, you'll carry on wondering what I meant. And you might ask your father. And I don't want you to do that because I don't want you to upset him. So I'm going to explain why I said what I said. But before I do that, you have to promise not to tell anyone I said this to you. And I asked, why? And she said, Christopher, please, just trust me. And I said, I promise. Because if Mrs. Alexander told me who killed Wellington, or she told me that Mr. Shears had really killed Mother, I could still go to the police and tell them, because you're allowed to break a promise if someone has committed a crime and you know about it. And Mrs. Alexander said, Your mother before she died, was very good friends with Mr. Shears. And I said, I know. And she said, no, Christopher, I'm not sure that you do. I mean that they were very good friends. Very, very good friends. I thought about this for a while and said, do you mean that they were doing sex? And Mrs. Alexander said, Yes, Christopher, that is what I mean. Then she didn't say anything for about 30 seconds. Then she said, I'm sorry, Christopher. I really didn't mean to say anything that was going to upset you. But I wanted to explain why I said what I said. You see, I thought you knew. That's why your father thinks that Mr. Shears is an evil man. And that will be why he doesn't want you going around talking to people about Mr. Shears, because that will bring back bad memories. And I said, was that why Mr. Shears left Mrs. Shears, because he was doing sex with someone else when he was married to Mrs. Shears? And Mrs. Alexander said, yes, I expect so. Then she said, I'm sorry, Christopher, I really am. And I said, I think I should go now. And she said, Are you okay, Christopher? And I said, I'm scared of being in the park with you because you're a stranger. And she said, I'm not a stranger, Christopher, I'm a friend. And I said, I'm going to go home now. And she said, If you want to talk about this, you can come and see me any time you want. You only have to knock on my door. And I said, Okay. And she said, Christopher? And I said, what? And she said, you won't tell your father about this conversation, will you? And I said, no, I promised. And she said, you go on home. And remember what I said, any time. Then I went home. Chapter 101. Mr. Jevons said that I liked maths because it was safe. He said I liked maths because it meant solving problems, and these problems were difficult and interesting, but there was always a straightforward answer at the end. And what he meant was that maths wasn't like life, because in life there are no straightforward answers at the end. I know he meant this, because this is what he said. This is because Mr. Jevons doesn't understand numbers. Here is a famous story called the Monty Hall problem, which I've included in this book because it illustrates what I mean. 
There used to be a column called Ask Marilyn in a magazine called Parade in America. And this column was written by Marilyn Vos Savant. And in the magazine, it said that she had the highest IQ in the world in the Guinness Book of World Records Hall of Fame. And in the column, she answered maths questions sent in by readers. And in September 1990, this question was sent in by Craig F. Whitaker of Columbia, Maryland. But it's not what's called a direct quote because I've made it simpler and easier to understand. You're on a game show on television. On this game show, the idea is to win a car as a prize. The game show host shows you three doors. He says that there is a car behind one of the doors and there are goats behind the other two doors. He asks you to pick a door. You pick a door, but the door is not opened. Then, the game show host opens one of the doors you didn't pick to show you a goat, because he knows what is behind the doors. Then, he says that you have one final chance to change your mind before the doors are opened and you get a car or a goat. So he asks you if you want to change your mind and pick the other unopened door instead. What should you do? Marilyn Vos Savant said that you should always change and pick the final door because the chances are two in three that there will be a car behind that door. But if you use your intuition, you think that chance is 50-50 because you think there's an equal chance that the car is behind any door. Lots of people wrote to the magazine to say that Marilyn Vos Savant was wrong, even when she explained very carefully why she was right. 92% of the letters she got about the problem said that she was wrong, and lots of these were from mathematicians and scientists. Here are some of the things that they said. I'm very concerned with the general public's lack of mathematical skills. Please help by confessing your error. Robert Sachs, PhD, George Mason University. There is enough mathematical illiteracy in this country, and we don't need the world's highest IQ propagating more. Shame. Scott Smith, PhD, University of Florida. I am in shock that after being corrected by at least three mathematicians, you still do not see your mistake. Kent Ford, Dickinson State University. I am sure you will receive many letters from high school and college students. Perhaps you should keep a few addresses for help with future columns. W. Robert Smith, PhD, Georgia State University. You are utterly incorrect. How many irate mathematicians are needed to get you to change your mind? E. Ray Bobo, PhD, Georgetown University. If all those PhDs were wrong, the country would be in very serious trouble. Everett Harmon, PhD, U.S. Army Research Institute. But Marilyn Vos Savant was right. And there are two ways you can show this. Firstly, you can do it by maths with an equation. The second way you can work it out is by stating all the possible outcomes, like this. You are asked to choose a door. You choose a door with a goat behind it. You stick, you get a goat. You change, you get a car. Or you choose another door with a goat behind it. You stick, you get a goat. You change, you get a car. Or you choose a door with a car behind it. You stick, you get a car. You change, you get a goat. So, if you change, two times out of three, you get a car. And if you stick, you only get a car one time out of three. And this shows that intuition can sometimes get things wrong. And intuition is what people use in life to make decisions. But logic can help you work out the right answer. It also shows that Mr. Jevons was wrong, and numbers are sometimes very complicated and not very straightforward at all. And that's why I like the Monty Hall problem. Chapter 103 When I got home, Rodri was there. Rodri is the man who works for Father, helping him do heating maintenance and boiler repair. And he sometimes comes round to the house in the evening to drink beer with father and watch the television and have a conversation. 
Rodri was wearing a pair of white dungarees which had dirty marks all over them, and he had a gold ring on the middle finger of his left hand, and he smelt of something I don't know the name of, which father often smells of when he comes home from work. I put my licorice laces and my milky bar in my special food box on the shelf which father's not allowed to touch because it's mine. Then father said, And what have you been up to, young man? And I said, I went to the shop to get some licorice laces and a milky bar. And he said, You were a long time. And I said, I talked to Mrs. Alexander's dog outside the shop, and I stroked him and he sniffed my trousers which was another white lie. Then Rodri said to me, God, you do get the third degree, don't you? But I didn't know what the third degree was. And he said, So, how you doing, Captain? And I said, I'm doing very well, thank you, which is what you're meant to say. And he said, What's 251 times 864? And I thought about this, and I said, 216,864, because it was a really easy sum, because you just multiply 864 times 1,000, which is 864,000. Then you divide it by 4, which is 216,000, and that's 250 times 864. Then you just add another 864 onto it to get 251 times 864, and that's 216,864. And I said, is that right? And Rodri said, oh, I haven't got a bloody clue. And he laughed. I don't like it when Rodri laughs at me. Rodri laughs at me a lot. Father says it's being friendly. Then Father said, I'll stick one of those gooby a loose sag things in the oven for you, OK? This is because I like Indian food, because it has a strong taste. But gooby a loose sag is yellow. So I put red food colouring into it before I eat it. And I keep a little plastic bottle of this in my special food box. And I said, OK. And Rodri said, So, it looks like Parky stitched them up then? But this was to Father, not to me. And Father said, Well, those circuit boards look like they come out the bloody ark. And Rodri said, You're going to tell them? And Father said, What's the point? They're hardly going to take him to court, are they? And Rodri said, that will be the day. And Father said, best to let sleeping dogs lie, I reckon. Then I went into the garden. Siobhan said that when you're writing a book, you have to include some descriptions of things. I said that I could take photographs and put them in the book. But she said the idea of a book was to describe things using words so that people could read them and make a picture in their own head. And she said it was best to describe things that were interesting or different. She also said that I should describe people in the story by mentioning one or two details about them so that people could make a picture of them in their head, which is why I wrote about Mr Jevons' shoes with all the holes in them and the policeman who looked as if he had two mice in his nose and the thing Rodri smelled of but I didn't know the name for. So I decided to do a description of the garden. But the garden wasn't very interesting or different. It was just a garden with grass and a shed and a clothesline. But the sky was interesting and different because usually skies look boring because they're all blue or all grey or all covered in one pattern of clouds and they don't look like they're hundreds of miles above your head. They look like someone might have painted them on a big roof. But this sky had lots of different types of clouds in it at different heights, so you could see how big it was, and this made it look enormous. Furthest away in the sky were lots of little white clouds, which looked like fish scales or sand dunes, which had a very regular pattern. Then, next furthest away into the west were some big clouds, which were coloured slightly orange, because it was nearly evening and the sun was going down. Then, closest to the ground, was a huge cloud which was coloured grey because it was a rain cloud, and it was a big pointy shape. And when I looked at it for a long time, I could see it moving very slowly, and it was like an alien spaceship 
hundreds of kilometers long, like in Dune or Blake 7 or Close Encounters of the Third Kind, except that it wasn't made of solid material, it was made of droplets of condensed water vapor, which is what clouds are made of. And it could have been an alien spaceship. People think that alien spaceships would be solid and made of metal and have lights all over them and move slowly through the sky, because that's how we'd build a spaceship if we were able to build one that big. But aliens, if they exist, would probably be very different from us. They might look like big slugs, or be flat like reflections, or they might be bigger than planets, or they might not have bodies at all. They might just be information, like in a computer, and their spaceships might look like clouds, or be made up of unconnected objects, like dust or leaves. Then I listened to the sounds in the garden, and I could hear a bird singing, and I could hear traffic noise, which was like the surf on a beach, and I could hear someone playing music somewhere and children shouting. And in between these noises, if I listened very carefully and stood completely still, I could hear a tiny whining noise inside my ears, and the air going in and out of my nose. Then I sniffed the air to see if I could see what the air in the garden smelled like. But I couldn't smell anything. It smelled of nothing. And this was interesting too. Then I went inside and fed Toby. Chapter 107 The Hound of the Baskervilles is my favourite book. In The Hound of the Baskervilles, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson get a visit from James Mortimer, who is a doctor from the Moors in Devon. James Mortimer's friend, Sir Charles Baskerville, has died of a heart attack, and James Mortimer thinks that he might have been scared to death. James Mortimer also has an ancient scroll which describes the curse of the Baskervilles. On this scroll, it says that Sir Charles Baskerville had an ancestor called Sir Hugo Baskerville, who was a wild, profane and godless man, and he tried to do sex with the daughter of a yeoman, but she escaped, and he chased her across the moor, and his friends, who were daredevil roisterers, chased after him. And when they found him, the daughter of the yeoman had died of exhaustion and fatigue, and they saw a great black beast shaped like a hound, yet larger than any hound that ever mortal eye has rested on, and this hound was tearing the throat out of Sir Hugo Baskerville. And one of the friends died of fear that very night, and the other two were broken men for the rest of their days. James Mortimer thinks that the Hound of the Baskervilles might have scared Sir Charles to death, and he's worried that his son and heir, Sir Henry Baskerville, will be in danger when he goes to the hall in Devon. So Sherlock Holmes sends Dr. Watson to Devon with Sir Henry Baskerville and James Mortimer, and Dr. Watson tries to work out who might have killed Sir Charles Baskerville. And Sherlock Holmes says that he will stay in London, but he travels to Devon secretly and does investigations of his own. And Sherlock Holmes finds out that Sir Charles was killed by a neighbour called Stapleton, who's a butterfly collector and a distant relation of the Baskervilles. And Stapleton is poor, so he tries to kill Sir Henry Baskerville so that he'll inherit the hall. In order to do this, he's brought a huge dog from London and covered it in phosphorus to make it glow in the dark. And it was this dog which scared Sir Charles Baskerville to death. And Sherlock Holmes and Watson and Lestrade from Scotland Yard catch him. And Sherlock Holmes and Watson shoot the dog, which is one of the dogs which gets killed in the story, which isn't nice because it's not the dog's fault. And Stapleton escapes into the Grimpin Mire, which is part of the moor, and he dies because he's sucked into a bog. There are some bits of the story I don't like. One bit is the ancient scroll, because it's written in old language which is difficult to understand, like this. Learn then from this story not to fear the fruits of the past, but rather to be circumspect in the future, that those foul passions whereby our family has suffered so grievously may not again be loosed to our undoing. And sometimes Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who's the author, describes people like this. There was something subtly wrong with the face, some coarseness of expression, some hardness, perhaps, of eye, some looseness of lip which marred its perfect beauty. 
and I don't know what some hardness perhaps of I means, and I'm not interested in faces. But sometimes it is fun not knowing what the words mean because you can look them up in a dictionary like goyle, which is a deep dip, or tors, which are hills or rocky heights. I like The Hound of the Baskervilles because it's a detective story, which means that there are clues and red herrings. These are some of the clues. 1. Two of Sir Henry Baskerville's boots go missing when he's staying at a hotel in London. This means that someone wants to give them to the Hound of the Baskervilles to smell like a bloodhound so that it can chase him. This means that the Hound of the Baskervilles is not a supernatural being, but a real dog. 2. Stapleton is the only person who knows how to get through the Grimpin Mire, and he tells Watson to stay out of it for his own safety. This means that he's hiding something in the middle of the Grimpin Mire and doesn't want anyone else to find it. 3. Mrs. Stapleton tells Dr. Watson to go straight back to London instantly. This is because she thinks Dr. Watson is Sir Henry Baskerville, and she knows that her husband wants to kill him. And these are some of the red herrings. 1. Sherlock Holmes and Watson are followed when they're in London by a man in a coach with a black beard. This makes you think that the man is Barrymore, who's the caretaker at Baskerville Hall, because he's the only other person who has a black beard, but the man is really Stapleton, who's wearing a false beard. 2. Selden, the Notting Hill murderer. This is a man who has escaped from a prison nearby and is being hunted down on the moors, which makes you think that he has something to do with the story, because he is a criminal, but he isn't anything to do with the story at all. 3. The Man on the Tour This is a silhouette of a man that Dr. Watson sees on the moor at night and doesn't recognise, which makes you think it's the murderer, but it's Sherlock Holmes who has come to Devon secretly. I also like The Hound of the Baskervilles because I like Sherlock Holmes, and I think that if I were a proper detective, he's the kind of detective I would be. He's very intelligent, and he solves the mystery, and he says... The world is full of obvious things which nobody by any chance ever observes. But he notices them, like I do. Also, it says in the book, Sherlock Holmes had, in a very remarkable degree, the power of detaching his mind at will. And this is like me too. Because if I get really interested in something, like practicing maths, or reading a book about the Apollo missions, or great white sharks, I don't notice anything else, and Father can be calling me to come and eat my supper and I won't hear him. And this is why I'm very good at playing chess, because I detach my mind at will and concentrate on the board, and after a while the person I'm playing will stop concentrating and start scratching their nose or staring out the window, and then they'll make a mistake and I'll win. Also, Dr. Watson says about Sherlock Holmes, his mind was busy in endeavouring to frame some scheme into which all these strange and apparently disconnected episodes could be fitted. And that's what I'm trying to do by writing this book. Also, Sherlock Holmes doesn't believe in the supernatural, which is God and fairy tales and hounds of hell and curses, which are stupid things. And I'm going to finish this chapter with two interesting facts about Sherlock Holmes. One. In the original Sherlock Holmes stories, Sherlock Holmes is never described as wearing a deerstalker hat, which is what he's always wearing in pictures and cartoons. The deerstalker hat was invented by a man called Sidney Paget, who did the illustrations for the original books. 2. In the Sherlock Holmes stories, Sherlock Holmes never says, Elementary, my dear Watson. He only ever says this in films and on television. Chapter 109 That night, I wrote some more of my book, and the next morning I took it into school so that Siobhan could read it and tell me if I'd made mistakes with the spelling and the grammar. Siobhan read the book during morning break, when she has a cup of coffee and sits at the edge of the playground with the other teachers. And after morning break, she came and sat down next to me, 
and said she had read the bit about my conversation with Mrs. Alexander, and she said, Have you told your father about this? And I replied, No. And she said, Are you going to tell your father about this? And I replied, No. And she said, Good. I think that's a good idea, Christopher. And then she said, Did it make you sad to find this out? And I asked, Find what out? And she said, Did it make you upset to find out that your mother and Mr. Shears had an affair? And I said, No. And she said, Are you telling the truth, Christopher? And then I said, I always tell the truth. And she said, I know you do, Christopher, but sometimes we get sad about things and we don't like to tell other people that we are sad about them. We like to keep it a secret. Or sometimes we're sad, but we don't really know we're sad. So we say we aren't sad, but we really are. And I said, I'm not sad. And she said, if you do start to feel sad about this, I want you to know that you can come and talk to me about it. Because I think talking to me will help you feel less sad. And if you don't feel sad, but you just want to talk to me about it, that would be okay too. Do you understand? And I said, I understand. And she said, good. And I replied, but I don't feel sad about it because mother's dead and because Mr. Shears isn't around anymore. So I would be feeling sad about something that isn't real and doesn't exist. And that would be stupid. And then I practiced maths for the rest of the morning. And at lunch, I didn't have the quiche because it was yellow, but I did have the carrots and the peas and lots of tomato ketchup. And for afters, I had some blackberry and apple crumble, but not the crumble bit because that was yellow too. And I got Mrs. Davis to take the crumble bit off before she put it onto my plate. Because it doesn't matter if different sorts of food are touching before they're actually on your plate. Then, after lunch, I spent the afternoon doing art with Mrs. Peters and I painted some pictures of aliens. Chapter 113 My memory is like a film. That's why I'm really good at remembering things, like the conversations I've written down in this book, and what people were wearing, and what they smelled like, because my memory has a smell track, which is like a soundtrack. And when people ask me to remember something, I can simply press rewind and fast forward and pause, like on a video recorder, but more like a DVD, because I don't have to rewind through everything in between to get to a memory of something a long time ago. And there are no buttons either, because it's happening in my head. If someone says to me, Christopher, tell me what your mother was like, I can rewind to lots of different scenes and say what she was like in those scenes. For example, I could rewind to 4th July 1992 when I was nine years old, which was a Saturday, and we were on holiday in Cornwall, and in the afternoon, we were on the beach in a place called Polparo, and Mother was wearing a pair of shorts made out of denim and a light blue bikini top, and she was smoking cigarettes called consulate, which were mint flavour. And she wasn't swimming. Mother was sunbathing on a towel, which had red and purple stripes, and she was reading a book by Georgette Heyer called The Masqueraders. And then she finished sunbathing and went into the water to swim, and she said, Bloody Nora, it's cold. And she said, I should come and swim too. But I don't like swimming because I don't like taking my clothes off. And she said I should just roll up my trousers and walk into the water a little way. So I did. And I stood in the water. And Mother said, look, it's lovely. And she jumped backwards and disappeared under the water. And I thought a shark had eaten her. And I screamed. And she stood up out of the water again and came over to where I was standing and held up her right hand and spread her fingers out in a fan and said, Come on, Christopher, touch my hand. Come on now, stop screaming. Touch my hand. Listen to me, Christopher, you can do it. And after a while, I stopped screaming and held up my left hand and spread my fingers out in a fan. And we made our fingers and our thumbs touch each other. And Mother said, It's okay, Christopher, it's okay. There aren't any sharks in Cornwall. And then I felt better. Except 
I can't remember anything before I was about four, because I wasn't looking at things in the right way before then, so they didn't get recorded properly. And this is how I recognise someone if I don't know who they are. I see what they're wearing, or if they have a walking stick, or funny hair, or a certain type of glasses, or they have a particular way of moving their arms, and I do a search through my memories to see if I've met them before. And this is also how I know how to act in difficult situations when I don't know what to do. For example, if people say things which don't make sense, like, see you later, alligator, or you'll catch your death in that, I do a search and see if I've ever heard someone say this before. And if someone is lying on the floor at school, I do a search through my memory to find a picture of someone having an epileptic fit. And then I compare the picture with what's happening in front of me, so I can decide whether they're just lying down and playing a game, or having a sleep, or whether they're having an epileptic fit. And if they are having an epileptic fit, I move any furniture out of the way to stop them banging their head, and I take my jumper off and I put it underneath their head, and I go and find a teacher. Other people have pictures in their heads too, but they're different because the pictures in my head are all pictures of things which really happened. But other people have pictures in their heads of things which aren't real and didn't happen. For example, sometimes mother used to say, if I hadn't married your father, I think I'd be living in a little farmhouse in the south of France with someone called Jean. And he'd be, oh, a local handyman, you know, doing painting and decorating for people, gardening, building fences, We'd have a veranda with figs growing over it. There'd be a field of sunflowers at the bottom of the garden, and a little town on the hill in the distance. We'd sit outside in the evening and drink red wine and smoke Galois cigarettes and watch the sun go down. And Siobhan once said that when she felt depressed or sad, she'd close her eyes and she'd imagine that she was staying in a house on Cape Cod with her friend Ellie, and they'd take a trip on a boat from Provincetown and go out into the bay to watch the humpback whales, and that made her feel calm and peaceful and happy. And sometimes, when someone has died, like mother died, people say, what would you want to say to your mother if she was here now? Or, what would your mother think about that? Which is stupid, because mother's dead, and you can't say anything to people who are dead, and dead people can't think. And grandmother has pictures in her head too, but her pictures are all confused, like someone's muddled the film up and she can't tell what happened in what order, so she thinks that dead people are still alive, and she doesn't know whether something happened in real life or whether it happened on television. Chapter 127 When I got home from school, father was still out at work, so I unlocked the front door and went inside and took my coat off. I went into the kitchen and put my things on the table, and one of the things was this book which I had taken into school to show to Siobhan. I made myself a raspberry milkshake and heated it up in the microwave, and then went through to the living room to watch one of my Blue Planet videos about life in the deepest parts of the ocean. The video was about the sea creatures who live around sulphur chimneys, which are underwater volcanoes where gases are ejected from the Earth's crust into the water. Scientists never expected there to be any living organisms there because it was so hot and so poisonous, but there are whole ecosystems there. I like this bit because it shows you that there's always something new that science can discover, and all the facts that you take for granted can be completely wrong. And also, I like the fact that they're filming in a place which is harder to get to than the top of Mount Everest, but is only a few miles away from sea level and it's one of the quietest and darkest and most secret places on the surface of the earth. And I like imagining that I'm there sometimes, in a spherical metal submersible with windows that are 30 centimetres thick to stop them from imploding under the pressure. And I imagine that I am the only person inside it, and that it's not connected to a ship at all, but it can operate under its own power, and I can control the motors and move anywhere I want to on the seabed, and I can never be found. Father came home at 5.48 p.m. I heard him come through the front door. Then he came into the living room. 
He was wearing a lime green and sky blue check shirt, and there was a double knot on one of his shoes, but not on the other. He was carrying an old advert for Fussell's milk powder, which was made of metal and painted with blue and white enamel and covered with little circles of rust, which were like bullet holes. But he didn't explain why he was carrying this. He said, Howdy, partner, which is a joke he does. And I said, Hello. I carried on watching the video and father went into the kitchen. I had forgotten that I had left my book lying on the kitchen table because I was too interested in the Blue Planet video. This is what is called relaxing your guard and it's what you must never do if you're a detective. It was 5.54 p.m. when father came back into the living room. He said, what is this? But he said it very quietly and I didn't realize that he was angry because he wasn't shouting. He was holding the book in his right hand. I said, it's a book I'm writing. And he said, is this true? Did you talk to Mrs. Alexander? He said this very quietly as well, so I still didn't realize that he was angry. And I said, yes. And he said, holy fucking Jesus, Christopher, how stupid are you? This is what Siobhan says is called a rhetorical question. It has a question mark at the end, but you're not meant to answer it because the person who's asking it already knows the answer. It's difficult to spot a rhetorical question. Then father said, what the fuck did I tell you, Christopher? This was much louder. And I replied, not to mention Mr. Shear's name in our house and not to go asking Mrs. Shears or anyone about who killed that bloody dog and not to go trespassing in other people's gardens and to stop this ridiculous bloody detective game. Except I haven't done any of those things. I just asked Mrs. Alexander about Mr. Shears because... But father interrupted me and said, Don't give me that bollocks, you little shit. You knew exactly what you were bloody doing. I've read the book, remember? And when he said this, he held up the book and shook it. What else did I say, Christopher? I thought that this might be another rhetorical question, but I wasn't sure. I found it hard to work out what to say because I was starting to get scared and confused. Then father repeated the question. What else did I say, Christopher? I said, I don't know. And he said, come on, you're the fucking memory man. But I couldn't think. And father said, not to go around sticking your fucking nose into other people's business. And what do you do? You go around sticking your nose into other people's business. You go around raking up the past and sharing it with every Tom, Dick and Harry you bump into. What am I going to do with you, Christopher? What the fuck am I going to do with you? I said, I was just doing chatting with Mrs. Alexander. I wasn't doing investigating. And he said, I ask you to do one thing for me, Christopher, one thing. And I said, I didn't want to talk to Mrs. Alexander. It was Mrs. Alexander who, but father interrupted me and grabbed hold of my arm really hard. Father had never grabbed hold of me like that before. Mother had hit me sometimes because she was a very hot tempered person which means that she got angry more quickly than other people and she shouted more often. But father is a more level-headed person, which means he doesn't get angry as quickly and he doesn't shout as often. So I was very surprised when he grabbed me. I don't like it when people grab me and I don't like being surprised either. So I hit him like I hit the policeman when he took hold of my arms and lifted me onto my feet. But father didn't let go and he was shouting. And I hit him again, and then I didn't know what I was doing anymore. I had no memories for a short while. I know it was a short while because I checked my watch afterwards. It was like someone had switched me off and then switched me on again. And when they switched me on again, I was sitting on the carpet with my back against the wall, and there was blood on my right hand, and the side of my head was hurting. And father was standing on the carpet a metre in front of me, looking down at me, 
and he was still holding my book in his right hand, but it was bent in half, and all the corners were messed up, and there was a scratch on his neck and a big rip in the sleeve of his green and blue check shirt, and he was breathing really deeply. After about a minute, he turned and he walked through to the kitchen. Then he unlocked the back door into the garden and went outside. I heard him lift the lid of the dustbin and drop something into it and put the lid of the dustbin back on. Then he came back into the kitchen again, but he wasn't carrying the book anymore. Then he locked the back door and put the key into the little china jug that shaped like a fat nun, and he stood in the middle of the kitchen and closed his eyes. Then he opened his eyes and he said, I need a fucking drink. And he got himself a can of beer. Chapter 131 These are some of the reasons why I hate yellow and brown. Yellow. 1. Custard. 2. Bananas. Bananas also turn brown. 3. Double yellow lines. 4. Yellow fever, which is a disease from tropical America and West Africa, which causes a high fever, acute nephritis, jaundice and hemorrhages. And it's caused by a virus transmitted by the bite of a mosquito called Aedes aegypti, which used to be called Stegomyia fasciata and nephritis is inflammation of the kidneys. 5. Yellow flowers. Because I get hay fever from flower pollen, which is one of three sorts of hay fever, and the others are from grass pollen and fungus pollen, and it makes me feel ill. 6. Sweet corn. Because it comes out in your poo and you don't digest it, so you're not really meant to eat it, like grass or leaves. Brown. 1. Dirt. 2. Gravy. 3. Poo. 4. Wood. Because people used to make machines and vehicles out of wood, but they don't anymore because wood breaks and goes rotten and has worms in sometimes, and now people make machines and vehicles out of metal and plastic, which are much better and more modern. 5. Melissa Brown, who is a girl at school, who is not actually brown like Anil or Mohammed. It's just her name, but she tore my big astronaut painting into two pieces and I threw it away, even after Mrs. Peters sellotaped it together again, because it looked broken. Mrs. Forbes said that hating yellow and brown is just being silly. And Siobhan said that she shouldn't say things like that, and everyone has favourite colours. And Siobhan was right, but Mrs Forbes was a bit right too. Because it is sort of being silly. But in life, you have to take lots of decisions, and if you don't take decisions, you would never do anything, because you'd spend all your time choosing between things you could do. So it's good to have a reason why you hate some things and you like others. It's like being in a restaurant, like when father takes me out to a Burnley Inn sometimes, and you look at the menu and you have to choose what you're going to have. But you don't know if you're going to like something because you haven't tasted it yet. So you have favourite foods and you choose these. And you have foods you don't like and you don't choose these. And then it's simple. Chapter 137 the next day, father said he was sorry that he had hit me, and he didn't mean to. He made me wash the cut on my cheek with Dettol to make sure that it wasn't infected. Then he got me to put a plaster on it so it didn't bleed. Then, because it was a Saturday, he said he was going to take me on an expedition to show me that he was properly sorry, and we were going to Twycross Zoo. So he made me some sandwiches with white bread and tomatoes and lettuce and ham and strawberry jam for me to eat because I don't like eating food from places I don't know. And he said it would be okay because there wouldn't be too many people at the zoo because it was forecast to rain. And I was glad about that because I don't like crowds of people and I like it when it's raining. 
so I went and got more waterproof, which is orange. Then we drove to Twycross Cross Zoo. I had never been to Twycross Cross Zoo before, so I didn't have a picture of it in my mind before we got there, so we bought a guidebook from the information centre, and then we walked round the whole zoo, and I decided which were my favourite animals. My favourite animals were 1. Randy Man, which is the name of the oldest red-faced black spider monkey, Atlees paniscus paniscus, ever kept in captivity. Randy Man is 44 years old, which is the same age as father. He used to be a pet on a ship and have a metal band round his stomach, like in a story about pirates. 2. The Patagonian sea lions, which are called Miracle and Star. 3. Maliku, which is an orangutan. I liked it especially because it was lying in a kind of hammock made out of a pair of stripy green pyjama bottoms, and on the blue plastic notice next to the cage, it said it made the hammock itself. Then we went to the cafe, and Father had place and chips and apple pie and ice cream and a pot of Earl Grey tea, and I had my sandwiches, and I read the guidebook to the zoo. And Father said, I love you very much, Christopher. Don't ever forget that. And I know I lose my rag occasionally. I know I get angry. I know I shout. And I know I shouldn't. But I only do it because I worry about you. Because I don't want to see you getting into trouble. Because I don't want you to get hurt. Do you understand? I didn't know whether I understood. So I said, I don't know. And Father said, Christopher, do you understand that I love you? And I said yes, because loving someone is helping them when they get into trouble and looking after them and telling them the truth. And Father looks after me when I get into trouble, like coming to the police station. And he looks after me by cooking meals for me. And he always tells me the truth, which means that he loves me. And then he held up his right hand and spread his fingers out in a fan. And I held up my left hand and spread my fingers out in a fan. And we made our fingers and thumbs touch each other. Then I got out a piece of paper from my bag, and I did a map of the zoo, from memory, as a test. Then we went and looked at the giraffes, and the smell of their poo was like the smell inside the gerbil cage at school when we had gerbils. And when they ran, their legs were so long, it looked like they were running in slow motion. Then Father said we had to get home before the roads got busy.